The deep dive is where I go into some really deep details about something from the paranormal community that caught my eye, and I want to talk about it. So, as many of you know, this guy is one of my favorites. I absolutely love the stuff that Jack Osborne does concerning the paranormal. And I want to talk a little bit about one of Jack's recent episodes of Ghost and Grit. This is his podcast, his paranormal podcast that he is doing right now. And for a few episodes, he was sat down with Katrina Weidman and they went into like a, a, a deep analysis of their show, Portals to Hell. They would pick random episodes and they do almost like a director's commentary. But it was just Jack and Katrina talking about it. So yeah, I, I love Portals to Hell. It is what I call the best paranormal show with one of the worst names. Uh, and then Jack, when I met, when I got the chance, I got the opportunity to meet Jack Osborne at the Penhurst Paracon. And one, not only was he a great guy, not only was he a great guy, but he actually told me about the original name of the show. And I'm like, oh my God, that's even worse. <laughs> It was even worse. So, yeah, that. Um, the original name of the show was going to be Hell Holes, and they were going to be looking in caves. And they realized that there were a finite amount of caves. So they did that thing. Um, now Jack is doing another round of Ghosts and Grit shows. He's doing it with a, uh, a psychic that he's worked with before on some of his projects. Lovely lady by the name of Cindy Casa. And I really like, I really like her a lot. And what they're covering right now is one of the more infamous uh, paranormal cases. And we're just going to go ahead, kick back, and have a listen to some if of the things that they're like saying. If you were going to search terrifying paranormal poltergeist case, mm -hmm. this has it all. It takes yeah. all the fucking boxes. Yeah. I mean, the only thing this doesn't have is someone's head spinning around and puking out pea soup. <laughs> no, no. All right, folks, brace yourselves for a trip back in time to Enfield, England right. in the late 1970s. The stage is set for one of the most bone-chilling cases in paranormal history. And I really regret that Marv has gone to bed. I, I really regret Marv has gone to bed uh, because, and I'll talk to you about why in just a moment. Um, is he Ozzy's son? Yes. The, the son of Ozzy Osbourne, the son of the Prince of Darkness, Jack Osbourne, is now a paranormal investigator. And I'm here to tell you, he is one of the best paranormal investigators out there. But I did want to talk about this particular episode and kind of say, Jack, are you sure about that? So let's let, let's let's move for, let's move a little forward. The Enfield Poltergeist. Lorraine Warren said that this was one of the most terrifying cases she had ever experienced in her entire career. Yes. Hold that thought. Hold that thought. And that's saying a lot. We're diving headfirst into a nightmare that is so terrifying it's been turned into numerous movies. A nightmare endured by an 11 year old Janet Hodgson and her family. I count them doing wrong right now. Imagine this poor kid dealing with violent disturbances that could literally make your skin fall. Furniture moving on its own, curtains turned into nooses, objects flying through the air like they've got their own mind. And while some menacing raspy voice echoes through the darkness. Doesn't seem possible that that could be something that Janet is doing herself. It sounds like the voice of a 70 year old smoker. It's really scary. And it doesn't end there. This family was plunged into a relentless nightmare that felt like it would never end. And let me tell you, the images captured during this ordeal seemingly defy gravity. The activity began two weeks after they brought the items into the house that belonged to the murderer of the girl across the way. Yes. It's like, that's really important evidence and information. And I feel like not a lot of people are talking about that. No. It kind of gets overlooked. This isn't just another ghost story. This is a real-life horror story, immortalized 
in the chilling photographs with dozens of eyewitnesses and extensive documentation that still sends chills down our spines today. And that is true. And that is true. But, oh yeah, Aquarius, um, Jack not only has been doing several investigations full on, he had a, he had a, a particularly successful show um, that you can still watch if you've got HBO Max or if you've got, well, I think they're just calling it Max now. Uh, it's on Max, but it's also on the Discovery Plus if you have Discovery Plus. You need to look up the show Portals to Hell, and it's quite good. Uh, no, actually not Bonnie's circumstantial evidence. It is not. This is, but but I, I'm saying that they have, they have really strong evidence, but it is strong evidence to a point. We're going to talk about that. We're, we're, we're going to talk about that. Yes, you're also right about that, Walker. He also has a couple of one shots. So no, Bonnie, it is not circumstantial. Um, the murder item things, not necessarily that either. We're, we're going to talk more in depth about that. So so just bear with me. Bear with me, everybody, and we'll, 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 we'll open it up for comments in a second. Here we go. Let me hear you say my name. This is a stark reminder that sometimes the most ordinary places can become a playground for unimaginable terror. No, no. But before we start, make sure you footage from the episode four that will evidence most. I'm jumping ahead past his ads. All right, well, welcome to Ghosts and Grit. I am Jack Osborne. I'm Cindy Keza. So we're changing things up a little bit here on Ghosts and Grit. Uh, we're gonna be doing deep dives into some of the most famous and bone chilling paranormal cases that have been documented over the years. Some of our cases will be of recent events, some going back to the 1800s. The case we're gonna be diving into today is the infamous Enfield Poltergeist case. This case is freaky. This case is really freaky, and it's also very, very famous. I mean, it should be famous because I think it's like one of the most terrifying paranormal cases of all time. I mean, The Exorcist came out in 1973, right? So after that, it's every mother's nightmare mm -hmm. that their young daughter could be possessed by this evil demonic spirit. And then we have this case. So I can only imagine what Mrs. Hodgson was thinking or feeling at the time. It's terrifying. I mean we might as well just start listing off the things that happened in this case. Go for it. Um, it was a family. They lived in a council house mm -hmm. in Enfield, England, which is like a borough of London. There was four children, uh, a single mother, and all of a sudden the family began to get plagued by very intense poltergeist activity. Right. We're talking objects being thrown, furniture being moved. Uh, people being strangled by curtains. Okay. So one of the things that I'm a little first first thing I want to do to take to kind of wag the finger at, at Jack and uh, Cindy for is there is and there 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 um there uh now what is that supposed to mean Bonnie that's you're 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 kind of jumping you're kind of jumping the gun here um the thing about the thing about this is that they ha this is truly one of the most documented of any paranormal investigation out there they have they being the the um i can't remember the name of the of the the paranormal society that that they're uh they're dealing with but they have hundreds of photos but um the the other thing about this particular case is they have hundreds of photos they have they have well over now i can't remember the name the number that jack quotes but the number that i heard was they had literally over 700 hours 700 hours of audio recordings and i'm going to leave it at that what i don't understand is why jack uh chose to do this that this is an ai rendered drawing this is an ai rendered photograph slash drawing so I'm I'm not sure why they did this being thrown furniture being moved now these are actual photographs these are actual photographs from the Enfield poltergeist case and then oh got it okay thank you for that remember I'm old I, I need some of these things sometimes explained to me 
Uh, People being strangled. Now, I understand why they did this. Because while they were talking about people being strangled by curtains, no one ever saw that. No one ever saw this girl, this particular girl, getting strangled by curtains. We never saw that. It is documented by an eyewitness, but that was never caught on film. Just throwing that out there. By curtains. People being strangled by curtains. Uh, hot marbles, they were described as hot. They were being thrown, and then when they were thrown, they would land and they wouldn't roll, which is really- That's really crazy. Yeah, very crazy. Doesn't make sense. No, not at all. They're like, that literally defies physics. There was also the possession slash channeling that occurred with <coughs> Janet, who was uh, 12 years old. Um, uh, Janet. Now, Janet is the focal voice point. was coming from Jan her mouth. They don't. They don't understand it. They had to, experts come in. We'll get. We'll do a deep dive into that part of it. Just so you all know, the music that you're hearing, it's coming from me, not them. It's coming from me. But it was very weird. This footage of it. This case is actually one of the most heavily documented paranormal cases. Right. There was 30 eyewitnesses to these events. And that is also 1800 true. 1,800 hours of actual documentation. Yes. That uh, now. Now that 1,800 hours. 700 of that is in audio, and then there's photographs, and then there's the eyewitness accounts of people, you know, coming and going from the space. So all of that is true. All of that is true. Uh, Which is very thorough, right? Very. And ultimately what made this case so famous was that the Warrens turned up. And... All right. Here's where I'm stepping in, everybody. <clears throat> One, that isn't the Warrens. Why they decided that they were using, yeah, not an actual photo of the Warrens, why they chose to do this. I can kind of answer that. The Warrens, and this is where I'm wagging a finger at, Jack's, at Jack on this. The Warrens never investigated this case. They said they did. I'm glad you asked. I'm glad you asked that, Bonnie. Okay, so the Warrens, <clears throat> the Warrens were, now I, I will say, the Warrens, Ed and Lorraine Warren, they were, what I would say, were the first people to really bring the paranormal to the mainstream. And we'll, well, I'm gonna touch on Aurelis, on Aurelis's comment in just a second. Now there are two camps of people who, are, are, who are who you know when, when we talk about the Warrens there are the people who are in one camp where the Warrens were literal superheroes like the, the movies from the conjuring it's all about cases that the Warrens were involved in right um and uh and so you have that right you've got people that basically say we wouldn't have ghost hunting we wouldn't have paranormal investigations as we know them, we wouldn't have an understanding or an acceptance of the paranormal had it not been for the Warrens. That is one camp. Then there's the other camp of the Warrens. <laughs> and as you can see, Aurelis, Walker, and myself tend to fall into the other category. Um, I think that the Warrens did a lot to bring the the issues of the paranormal, you know, forward, okay, and 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 bring it out of the closet and and bring it forward to the mainstream, okay. Ed and Lorraine Warren were the first real, and I'm just going to throw out their big, huge quotes on this. They were the first mainstream paranormal investigators. That being said, Ed and Lorraine Warren were also something of con artists. Apparently how Ed and Lorraine got into this, the story goes, is that Ed and Lorraine were doing um, phone, you know, they were, they were doing phone sales. And in the middle of a conversation with, you know, trying to, you know, trying to sell their things, Lorraine would start asking questions. And she would do more or less what, what, uh, what psychics would do with cold readings and go, do you know, I think we need to get to your house. Because it sounds like there's something there. I'm getting the impression that there's something there. Um, but The Conjuring, they're the couple behind The Conjuring. 
and that was a case they actually investigated. When it comes to the Enfield poltergeist, which The Conjuring 2 was about, they make Ed and Lorraine Warren out to be the people that investigated this case. That is not the case. And the reason I'm getting worked up about this is because I feel like Jack Osborne should have known better. Cindy Kaza should have definitely known better. But Jack, Jack should have known better. And, <clears throat> and the other reason why there's, a, there's some bad juju about Ed Warren, again, trigger warnings coming up for anybody who has a sensitive background. Ed had a ward and we're just gonna leave it at that it was a very suspicious thing it was a very suspicious relationship that ed was having with this young teenage girl and lorraine was looking the other way not sure what's going on there but this is part of ed and lorraine warren's background but when it comes to the enfield poltergeist i get particularly uh worked up about this because Ed and Lorraine Warren showed up on on one day, one day on a case that was that was that was investigated for years. They showed up for one day and they said, we investigated. They never investigated the Enfield Poltergeist, according to according to the Enfield Poltergeist documentary that dropped last year on Apple Plus. They show up in all of the documentation. They show up in one one moment of recorded footage where they were talking to the mother and basically saying, well, if you want more coverage of this, we've got connections. We can get you on talk shows. We can make you famous. And the truth was the mother just wanted this all to stop. The, the other issue about Ed and Lorraine Warren that I have, this is my main issue is that Ed claims, I don't know about Lorraine, but Ed claims that they investigated over 10,000 cases. There are not enough hours in the day to investigate 10,000 cases. Um, yeah, okay. So apparently they also did a radio interview. That was not depicted in the Enfield Poltergeist docuseries. But, um, yeah, they they did a radio interview, apparently. But that was an investigation. That's not an investigation. An investigation is being an active participant in it. Ed and Lorraine were a lot of things, uh, but they were not active participants in the Enfield Poltergeist case. And um, I'm not sure why Jack and uh, Cindy are giving these two such credence. Because... The, the, they are they are a real hot spot and they 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 make a lot of claims of stuff that they investigated that they never investigated so yeah i have I, this is my first this is my first main contention with what jack and cindy are going with this they partook in investigating and figuring out what the fuck is going on. Lorraine Warren said that this was one of the most terrifying cases she had ever experienced in her entire career, as far as I understand. Yes. And that's saying a lot. It has all the keywords. This is like, if you were gonna like search, you know, terrifying paranormal poltergeist case, mm -hmm. this has it all. It ticks yeah. all the fucking boxes. Yeah. I mean, the only thing this doesn't have is someone's head spinning around and puking out pea soup. Right. And I would say that's that's true. That is true. The Enfield Poltergeist case is one of the most infamous cases uh, when it comes to the paranormal. When it comes to the paranormal, absolutely true. That is that is that is true. But the the Warrens' involvement in it that is up for debate. That is up for serious debate. I mean, it's true. And and I think for me, the real kicker is like the 30 eyewitnesses, 30 plus. Mm -hmm. If all of these people are experiencing things happening in this house, it's you can't deny that. And we should probably be clear that it wasn't just paranormal investigators. No. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Now, now this is also very important. This is also very important. Right. It was police. It was journalists. It was other family members, uh, neighbors. A lot of people were called in to try and figure out what the fuck was going on. Right. I want to acknowledge the main reason why we're jumping into this.
in 2023, the photojournalist that was called in from a, a local British tabloid, he, he was tasked with covering this event, mm -hmm. seeing if it was bunk or not, like mm -hmm. what's going on here. Mm -hmm. Supposedly, he said that the pictures were fake, the girl was jumping, she wasn't really being thrown through the air. Well, he came out in 2023 to set the record straight and stated that he never actually said they were faked and he believed them all to be real and true. Oh, wow. So somebody said that he said they were faked yes. and he actually did not say that. Yeah. Wow. So I don't know, and I'm the first one to say this, I do not know where this photographer came out and, 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 and said that, right? Came out and admitted that. But I can say that in 2023, this photographer did go on this documentary and state that. And this documentary is called The Enfield Poltergeist. If you have Apple Plus, I highly recommend you watch this three-part series. It's a three-part series on, on Apple, and it's, it's called The Enfield Poltergeist. And what's really, really cool about how they did this is that they rebuilt the house as, as a set. They rebuilt the house and then they used all of these hours and hours and hours of recorded footage and they hired actors to lip sync to the footage, to the audio footage, and they did actual reenactments of what what supposedly happened and was caught on film and was caught on 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 you know uh 35 millimeter film and on audio this is a fascinating three-part series and what's really interesting about the series is it starts about the paranormal and you are totally totally oh yeah oh oh aquarius it is it is from a from a, a so you've seen it Aurelis. you've seen it right from a production aspect of it, it's a phenomenal documentary. It's a phenomenal docu-series. I highly, highly, highly recommend it. And yeah, um, we're actually we're actually going to be show. Oh, actually, that was Twitch Mom popping that up. Yeah. Um, but the thing is, and I'm gonna I'm gonna reserve more thoughts about the Enfield Poltergeist docu-series. But that was when it came out in 2023. You remember when I said Marv, I'm sorry, Marv was, was asleep or Marv has gone back to bed. Um, the thing is, the thing is, Marv was here and we were going to watch. We were just going to say, ah, oh, we'll just watch the first episode, see what it's like. We wound up spending our Saturday afternoon on my birthday. We, 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 we actually spent the morning watching this. And when it ended, we all just, it was me. Do you remember this, hon? Do you remember this, Twitch mom? Me? Pip and Marv were all sitting in, in our family room. We finished the final episode and we just looked at each other and we were just like, holy cow. We were just, it was just, we, our minds were just absolutely fried. And I'll explain why in a moment, but I can tell you this. It is truly a compelling case. It starts one way and it ends in a completely different perspective. And... Okay, and and it was on that it was on that series that they got the photographer to uh, to come in and go, yeah, this is exactly the way I remember it, and he and he admitted he was he was like, yeah, um, these were these were you know I don't know how these these photographs happened, but they happened, and he explains it, he he totally explains it. Anyway, so and and what what I'm bummed out about. Is that Jack and Cindy never mention the Apple Plus series, and I think it's because I hate to say this, I think it goes against w the point that they're trying to make about the case. And I'll again, I'll, I'll touch on that in a second. Yeah, I mean that's a big deal because it turns all of those ideas on their head, right? Mm -hmm. That people are saying, well, he said this. It's like he was there. Yeah, because that that was the, ultimately that was the holdout for this case. Mm -hmm. Everyone said, oh, well, the, 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 the journalist who was there said this was all bullshit. But he never said that. That's pretty, that's pretty interesting. I mean, it's, I could see why a journalist would say that if they were afraid that they would. Just so you all know, we're not going to watch this whole episode. We're only going to watch the first, uh, you know, the, 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 the first chunk of it. And, and yeah, and then I'll, I'll, I'll wrap up. So I just want to make sure you all knew I'm not going to give you the I'm not going to give you the whole thing. 
<laughs> I'm not going to give you the whole thing. All right, here we go. Lose their credibility mm -hmm. going forward. I know, that's what she said. Okay. Forward. Big time. And it's like maybe the risk is not so high now for him to come out and say, hey, actually, this did happen. Because why didn't he come out before and say, mm -hmm. no, I didn't say that. And let's also, like, clarify, this was in the 70s, 1977. Mm -hmm. There was still journalistic integrity back then. <laughs> <laughs> like journalists didn't just make shit up for the sake mm -hmm. of making shit up mm -hmm. because as you said their career was legitimately on the right. line if they fuck right. up this right. is a story for me that really grasps my imagination mm -hmm. and i can't seem to shake it off because it is so fucked up yeah it's crazy i mean look it's like anytime you have kids that are channeling voices mm -hmm. and flying through the room and so it's the making of like the worst horror movie ever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, London in the '70s, it 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 wasn't always. It's not the not the happiest, brightest place. No, it's Canada. not. No, it was not. So, it was there. Was, it was rough haunting. around the edges. It went on for about two years, and it was relatively consistent in that two-year period. Mm -hmm. And as you stated earlier, there were 30 eyewitnesses over that two-year. And period, there were. And it That's came from. True members of the press yep. to the police yep. to uh, paranormal investigators yep. to photographers i mean there was a lot of people that came through this house to see what was going on right. and many <laughs> that of them it did had nick that it did how you doing ilf experiences. good to see you it got so bad that they started reaching out to paranormal investigators and that led them to contacting the warrens and the warrens coming out to that's not necessarily true. That is, again, not necessarily true. The way I understood it, and I know that my wife is in there, my 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 wife is out there. If The way I remember it, the way I remember it, the Warrens contacted them. The Warrens contacted them, but it, it, if they, if, because why would a British, a British society reach out to a pair of Yanks? It's as true as the AI image. Exactly. Exactly. Oh wait, they did? Wait. So they so so you're saying that that the British society actually reached out to uh to the Warrens, not the other way around. The Warrens reached out to them. That's the way I thought it was. I thought it was the Warrens reached out to them, not vice versa. <clears throat> Which way was it? Did the Warrens contact them or did they contact the Warrens? The Warrens reached out. Yeah, exactly. The Warrens reached out. Because the Warrens, they, yeah, you know, at, at the and also keep in mind when the Warrens reached out, there had been, there had been activity, there had been activity on this one. You don't have to worry about joking. Uh, there had been activity. There had been people talking about it, and then the Warrens were like, "We can help. We're Americans. We can help." To investigate. So yeah. So yeah. There's Not, a lot of substance so. To this. So again, this this I'm a little pissed off about. Because Jack, I feel like Jack is 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 adding to a false narrative, right? He's adding to the this false narrative that that the British were good, we're going to reach out to the Warrens. No, the Warrens reached out to to uh, to the family. Entirely different situation. Now, some of the gory details: furniture was rearranged. With yes, and that is documented in audio, and in some still shots. Violent intent. Objects were hurled through the air and flames spontaneously. Now, again, this is an AI. This is an AI generated image of all the photographs that they caught of all the photographs they caught. None of them had fire involved erupted. A lot of people say that that showcases some demonic entity or power. Whatever. It could also be faulty wiring from the 1970s in government sponsored homing, ho homing, homing, uh, home uh units but okay ever now what i want to know is why them why that house and what what possibly could have gone on there to invite this entity in because as this story unfolds what was discovered as far as who this spirit could be <laughs> at face value it it, it doesn't, it doesn't add, really make sense. It doesn't right? add up. It's like, why is it this guy? What's the point? Yes. Right. So, right. what do you think about this case, for, you know, based on the facts? Well, 
I think it's really important to talk about the fact that there was a man who lived across the way who murdered his daughter. Mm. The Hodgson family had items in their house from the murderer's house across the way. They had curtains, they had uh, a chair, they had a cabinet, and Mrs. Hodgson actually said that the activity began about two weeks after they brought the items into their home. Okay. Again, all that is true. Now, I know that Bonnie uh, mentioned something about that being circumstantial, and that is true to some extent. The so in in the paranormal, just 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 for clarification and just to let everybody know, in paranormal there is such thing called trigger objects, and you'll hear people talk about trigger objects. Now, um, I I'm hot and cold about trigger objects, but I'm willing to. It's a theory that I'm willing to roll with because there could be some emotional attachment to something like that. Um, <laughs> the Warrens are in fact the actual mother and father of AI, possibly. Um, at least that's what they would tell you. I don't like that they're using AI images. I feel like they were just trying to fill in the space. I noticed at the beginning, they kept replaying the same images. So maybe they just don't have the access to enough of the photos to use. That is a possibility, Aquarius. What I'm confused about is that there are plenty of these photographs open to the public. So I'm not sure what, in, in particular, that infamous image which we're about to see of the girl being being thrown out of her bed, okay? I don't know why they didn't have access to that, but they could have used clips. They could have sparingly used clips, I think, from the, uh, from, from the documentary on Apple Plus. Why they haven't, the Warrens are social media entrepreneurs. They would have been. They would have been if they if they were if they had been if they had been born uh, twenty years later. Yes, they probably would have. It's weird that the actual images are easily available online. See again, this is why I don't understand why they're going the AI route. I I just don't get that. But um, all everything that they have been talking about has been pretty much on on par. Everything has been been on the level, with the exception of the Warrens' involvement in it. Um, so, so the, the thing about the trigger objects, what that means is if for anybody who is not familiar with that trigger objects are things where if something really traumatic happens in a space or in a, or in a, or in a, in a location or a place, it is believed that, that whatever impressions, if you want to call them psychic impressions, you can, but whatever impressions, whatever energy that is expelled from the human body, because yes, we are, you know, part of us is, part of us are energy. We generate heat and all that stuff. Ergo, we do it. We are made of energy. But if we impart any of that onto ourselves, um, to, to, to an object in our room, I mean, perfect example would be this, right? If, you, if you've seen this in my, in my, um, in, you know, hanging off of my, on my boom, boom mic, this is the pendant from Tomb Raider, right? Well, let's say Tomb Raider was and is a favorite trilogy of mine. So there's a part of me that's that's probably impressed impressed itself because you know there were a couple of times I would play with this medallion if I was getting nervous during a cutscene or something like that. My my impressions, whatever that you want to call them, psychic impressions, energy impressions, are put on this on on this right, and then I die. Okay, I die. And you decide, hey, I'm going to take this. I'm going to take this as a as a memento of tea, right? Then suddenly, weird shit starts happening in your house. You know, like, um, you know, you notice that the garlic aioli is disappearing a little faster. You'll notice that you can't see anything on your YouTube, uh, wherever the pendant is. You can't see anything on YouTube other than paranormal co programming. That kind of thing is is usually attributed to some type of energy coming from a trigger object, and in this case. In this case, um, what they're saying is, is that a, a brutal murder, a brutal murder happens, right, across the way. And then the family basically says, well, if no one's going to do anything with the furniture, we could use a cabinet and chair and a couple other things, right? And they bring this stuff that happened where this horrific crime occurs, and they brought it into their house. Now... You might think that's kind of weird, but when you consider that that the mother and the family are, you know, not necessarily, you know, they're 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 lower class. They're they're on government funded 
housing. You know, they're 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 trying to make ends meet. England has a very different attitude, at least back then. England has a very different attitude when it comes to that type of recycling. They're like, look, um, we need to get by. We need to do we need to do what we need to do to survive. So we're gonna, you know, in, instead of just chucking the furniture, you know, scrapping it or what have you, we'll just take we'll we'll just help ourselves to it if if, if the relatives are giving it away. And they were, and he took it, right? So they've got this furniture in their house that came from a, a a place where a brutal murder occurred and now weird stuff is happening now that could be considered uh you know that could be an issue of bad timing it could be an issue of circumstantial but it is kind of compelling when you think about well the problems didn't start until we took the furniture from where the brutal murder occurred into our house you know it's it's just a thought it is just, it is one of the many theories that you will encounter when getting into the paranormal, okay? You know, we could use some curtains. Nah, not really. Yeah, you see, you see what I mean? Uh, okay, and that's one of the things that they don't talk about. They're not necessarily talking about, they're, like, they, they ask, why did they bring this furniture in? Because they were, they really did, you know? They, they really didn't have a lot of things going for them, and they needed stuff to get by. So that was what they did, right? Now, Aurelis is getting into an even deeper uh, concept of the paranormal, which is, well, can stuff be manifested? You know, can enough people think hard enough and, and, and truly believe in a concept or a figure or a thing and actually create um, a haunting where there was no haunting? That's a pretty popular um, belief. And and <clears throat> the answer is, we don't know for sure. And you're going to find that out a lot when it comes to the paranormal. There's some things that make sense and some things that don't. My thoughts about that are, I don't know if it's possible, but if, and I do mean if, there is no documentation of any bad juju happening in a spot, then this could be this could be your mind playing tricks on you and um and this is where we start getting into the weird corners of the paranormal once you bring that object in can the energy spread to other objects like an infection so queries and that's a great question that is a great question it doesn't necessarily affect other objects but in the theory of trigger objects it starts affecting other people it affects the space that it's in. I'll, I'll, I'll throw this out to you. I'll throw this out to you. What if you found out? What if you found out, right, that you had a really phenomenal couch, right? There was a couch that this guy was like, yeah, I've, um, um, I've got this couch. Um, it's, it's perfectly good. It's soft. It's comfortable, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so why are you giving it to me? Well, I'm giving it to you because my wife passed away in that couch. Okay? So here's the question. Would you take that would you take that couch? I can speak from um I can speak from uh from from personal feelings on this. Um I had the opportunity. I had the opportunity to keep the furniture that uh, that was in, a, in in my house when I moved back in. And I said, no, I, I just want to go on ahead and get it out of the house and um, and start fresh. You know, and I just I just didn't feel comfortable with it. And um, my in-law, my I should rephrase that, my former in-laws took that couch. And I remember going to something at their house and I saw the furniture there. I spent maybe two minutes in that couch and I said, I have to move. And, and there's, and, and it just, I just didn't feel comfortable with it. Now the theory is, the theory is, is that uh, I don't believe in the paranormal, but taking the couch someone died on and use it feels sort of disrespectful, especially if I know the person. Exactly. And that is fine. 
By the way, if, if you don't believe in the paranormal, that's fine too, Aquarius. If you're along for the ride, you're along for the ride. I'm not here to tell you you're right or wrong. I'm just here to tell you what I'm experiencing, right? And the theory behind trigger objects is that that there was something left in that couch, you know, and now you're bringing it into your house. And that's the that's what happened. That is the uh, the the theory of what happened. Everything was fine in that house, and then the murder occurred across the street. Furniture from that murder site came into that house, and then things started happening. Weird things started happening. So there's that. Okay, getting back to this. So do you believe that they brought in haunted objects into the house? It's possible, because these objects contain energy. Mm. They contain psychic... And it is possible. It is possible. Do I think for sure that's what it is? That I can't tell you. The imprinting. And then there's apparently a man who's, you know, after the young daughter, Janet. Uh, so who's to say it's not this guy that's in the house? What experiences have you had with haunted objects? Well, in all the paranormal investigations that I've done, I think I can say and probably... 90% of them, I've done something called psychometry. So that's when you touch an object and you read the energetic imprint or memory left behind on the object, right? And it's really, really effective using that technique because you can see things that have happened in the past. You can see things that have happened to the family in the present that are connected to the object. And I'd call that a force echo, which is what happens in Star Wars Jedi Survivor and Jedi Fallen Order. Cal Kestis has the ability of touching an object or just putting his hand over an object, and it's the Force Echo. So, look, I'm I'm the first one to say it. I have issues when it comes to psychics. I have some issues when it comes. Oh, by the way, Sly, uh, Sly Gamer didn't want di to didn't want to didn't want to offend you and and not make you think I didn't see you. Hi, how are you doing? I hope you're doing well. I'm not dismissing Cindy Kaz's abilities. I'm not calling that Cindy, I'm not calling out Cindy Casa. But um I'm just saying it's it's a bit like the whole Force Echo thing from Jedi Fallen Order. I'm just throwing that out there. And uh, they hold energy. These objects hold energy. Mm. And because they brought these objects in so quickly after this girl was murdered by her father, I have to say like there there probably was a lot of imprinting on those objects. Here's a thought. What if okay, so the father that killed his daughter across the street right what if that same entity what oh what if it possessed the father what if the father was possessed mm. that's a really interesting point because mrs hodgson said the activity first began about two weeks after they brought the items into the home and then all of a sudden there's i didn't know that john so thanks for thanks for setting me straight on that just because i look just make sure everybody in chat knows just because I've been at this for a whopping coming up on three years doesn't mean I'm an expert. It just means I've experienced some really wild shit. But if, um, but I, but I will say if 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 you have something to you know make my brain feel a little bigger, I'm all for it. I'm all for it. So just remember that. This male presence. Mm -hmm haunting the family and going after Janet. I wonder how old the, the girl was that got murdered by her dad. I she think. was five or six. Oh, she was really little. Okay, yeah. yeah but and Spence is absolutely right. Approach everything with a with a decorum of respect. It's, it's, it's you know, it's a decorum of respect. Absolutely. Still, I mean, <clears throat> that's a really good point. Mm -hmm. Because it really doesn't make sense. Why is the owner, the, the old owner of the home haunting them that way? It that not that's what doesn't add up because and we'll get to it when you see an interview with Janet she was channeling again this is an AI image this is an AI image right here this entity who went by the name of Bill and he said he died in a chair we're gonna get to that that moment where you, you saw her I'm gonna I'm gonna we actually saw the video of her we're gonna we're gonna talk about that in a moment too. In the downstairs <clears throat> living room and had some kind of like heart embolism or something. I like a, an old man dying in a chair doesn't really strike me as, you know, 
a nefarious demonic entity that's going to start throwing people around mm -hmm. and you know anytime we have activity like this and then there's an agent who let's call janet the agent right the agent is the focus the person that could be emitting the pk energy and also the person who could be very open to the spirit world that's calling in the spirits in my opinion and i think when they say pk I believe that stands for, and if anyone can double check this, uh, whether it's uh, Spence or whether it is my wife, I believe PK stands for psychokinetic energy. PKE, psychokinetic energy, right? In for there to be poltergeist activity, there has to be this PK energy and also uh, a connection to the spirit world. Bill could have been there, but do I think that Bill is the one responsible for this really, really aggressive behavior? It doesn't feel right to me. It feels no. like there's something much darker happening yes, there. Yes, that's taking on the persona of Bill. Right. Because we, I, at least in my experience with investigating, I think I've come across cases like that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, just, it's smart for a spirit to do that because if you don't know what you're dealing with, how can you remove it? Mm -hmm. I mean, you can try, but it helps if you know exactly what you're dealing with. Yeah, and the darker and the darker things never present mm -hmm. with what they really are. Right. Yeah. Um, so let's dive into some of the the supernatural and unexplained about this case. So it started with <coughs> Peggy hearing noises in Margaret and Janet's room, in 1977. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. She later would discover the girls being totally freaked out because furniture was moving around in their bedroom and like moving towards them. They ended up going to police and trying to get some help. They went to their neighbors. They reached out to whoever. No worries, could Spence. Go, That's fine. What the hell's going on? Uh, in addition to furniture moving, the girls would wake up in the night and hear the knocking. The quintessential right. paranormal, you know, knocking. So the family. So far, so good. Everything's uh, everything's above board here. Um, more like furniture overturning. Right. Cups would spontaneously fill with water. Fires started without apparent cause. Now, I will say the the the, the cups filling themselves up, and the fire starting without cause. That was not documented. At least that was not mentioned in the Enfield Poltergeist uh, docu series. So I'm not sure where those stories are coming from, but I'm not just going to outright dismiss them either. And a curtain attempted to strangle Janet. Yeah. And I think, I think that was mentioned. That was mentioned. And it's the curtain. Now, this image right here is an actual photograph. This is not AI. This is an actual photograph. And, and they go into this in just a second. They came from the murderer's house. <laughs> And wasn't there also something about um, marbles that would like materialize out of the curtain? Yeah, they would. So it's called apportation. Okay. So in the in the world of mediumship, we call it thing apportation. Things ap apporting from the sky, right? Uh, it can happen. They just materialize out of nowhere. Yeah. Or from the spirit world, right? But it gets way way creepier. So there's two pieces of evidence that make this case exceptionally legendary the first is a photo right of jan and this is a legit photo and in the docuseries in the docuseries you actually see the progression of the photos this is the this is the documented photo that came from the infield poltergeist investigation and what happens is is that they had the um i cannot remember how he described how the timer worked on the um, uh, on the uh, uh, on, on the, the the trigger on the trigger of the uh, of, of the camera, but that was what I, I want to say it was maybe on a timer. It might if it wasn't on the timer, it was on uh, it was it was set to motion, and it picked up some kind of motion, and you literally see fr uh, in in a matter of seconds. Her go from the bed up to that height, which if she was lying prone would be pretty hard to do. Uh, but but we're, we're going to get into this a little more. So here we go. Janet flying through the air. Right. Allegedly, she was tossed out of bed by a spirit. Mm -hmm. The second piece of evidence is from a BBC documentary that investigated the house and the hauntings right. while they were still going on. In this footage... Janet 
appears to be emitting some kind of disembodied voice from her own mouth. And it is the freakiest, weirdest, twistedest fucking thing I've ever seen. Yeah. I think the only thing we can do right, right. now right. is just play this clip. In this documentary. So here's the clip. They sat down and interviewed Janet and her sister Margaret. Mm hmm. It shot sometime in the 70s, um, mm -hmm. and you will see Janet speaking in this very strange voice. But and I'm going to stop this here for just a second, and I'm actually going to turn off the music. Just going to turn off the music so you can get the full effect of this uh, of this this voice. And then, yeah. But her mouth is not moving. All right, so this is this yeah. We are. Moderate. We'd already talked about. Uh, we'd already talked about that faulty wiring. Hi, Jerry. Now watch, watch Janet. Look, she her hands in front of her face. Is anybody there? She moves it. Now, if no, you see, no. Who's there? Doctor. Doctor Who. It's so scary. It's so scary. So, the thing about the voice. Again, this clip was also not featured on the infield poltergeist. But this actually kind of drives home um, a problem that I had with uh, with the uh, with with the whole voice thing. So so um, she basically gets she, she does the voice and the voice says, you know, knock, knock. Who's there? Doctor. And he goes, Doctor Who? And she just smiles. One, that's a that's a that's a kid's that's a kid's joke. That's a kid's joke, right? And the claim was was that this voice was supposed to be the um was supposed to be an older gentleman. One of the older gentlemen that either died in that house or died in the house across the street, right? And you notice she was playing around with her with her mouth like this, you know, just kind of kind of playing around with her mouth, blah blah blah. And she did the she did the she she did uh a different she she said different things while her hand was up here. And then when it came down, she was doing basic ventriloquism. Now, this is great. Anyone want to hug? Here's no where, hugs. here's where the, and so now I'm going back to the Enfield Poltergeist docuseries, which I really wish Jack and Cindy had cited a little more in this, in this analysis of the Enfield Poltergeist, because the first part of the Enfield Poltergeist episode you really have to ask yourself at the end of it, what's going on? Because it does feel like there's something, there's something there, and it's angry, and it's and it's just, and um, and the uh, the whole thing with her being tossed out of bed. That photo was legit, and it was in fact authenticated, and they actually have the progression of the photographs, right, of her getting thrown out of bed. And at one point, Jack is looking in, in uh, looking in, and he goes, "I can't tell if this if the kid is there with a doll." No, it's the other daughter, because had he seen this epi had he seen this uh, this docu series, just done, and and this is a most this is a recent series, so it's really accessible. He would have seen, <clears throat> or he would have known that all the kids had been moved into one room because the kids were all experiencing different things, and uh, yeah. There were, there were just some issues there. And actually, one of the kids, one of the things they didn't mention was that one of the kids was actually shipped off to a school <clears throat> for behavior. And that's the other thing. One of the kids was shipped off to school for behavioral purposes. Again, keep that in mind. <clears throat> so, so the first part really has you wondering what the hell is going on. Because of all this incredible evidence... Then there's part two, and that's when the voice gets introduced. And one of the things about this voice that was a little sus was that was one of the rare times, that BBC moment was one of the rare times that she was filmed with that voice coming out of her. The only other time that voice would happen, the investigators would have to go into the room where she was, and she was by herself in the room, but then they'd have to face the closet, and she would she would then openly talk to them. And then she was asking things like one of the one of the line of questions that this elder spirit 
channeling through this little girl was asking the the um, the investigators were were the, some of the questions involved menstrual cycles, and you know, and and they have this on audio. They have the recordings of it, and they play it in the episode. They play it in the in, in the in the documentary. And it's, it's like, this is, wait, what is going on? Because if this is an elder spirit, if this is a spirit, whether it's demonic or otherwise, they're going to know what a menstrual cycle is. And, it, and, and the, the conversations were just getting more and more bizarre. Well, then they brought in a female investigator. So that, that, that rules out the possibility of someone else talking off camera. And, and yeah, Exactly. But then you've got, when the female investigator would come in, she came in and she would be like, um, she would be like, I want to talk to you. And the, um, and, and she was compliant to a, uh, she was compliant to a point. She would then say, I don't want to do this anymore. I don't want to, you know, I, um, <clears throat> and, and uh, I don't want to do this anymore. And they'd turn around and then the little girl would be like, he doesn't want to talk to you anymore. She wouldn't try the voice would just go away. If the woman investigator turned around to face her, the voice would go away. If the woman, um, if, if other men came in and again, stood with their backs to her, she'd be, she, she would call the, she would call the female investigator a bitch, a whore and all these other horrible things. Again, all of this documented on tape, all of this documented it's, it's, oh, this in, 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 uh, in audio recordings. Again, this is something they don't talk about. And um, did they try it with the men turning around? Um, they basically, they, they, uh, she would tell them. And here's another thing that they didn't necessarily touch on. And this is where we get to part three of the investigation. Uh, part three of the, of the docuseries. So in part two, basically they've got, um, there, there's this little girl that's basically telling them what to do. She basically says, if you want him to talk to you, you have to face the closet. Otherwise, he doesn't want to talk to you. That's what she would tell them. And they were, and all the men were super compliant. But the one woman in this group, in this uh, this uh, this group, this psycho, this uh, this psychic group, or I can't remember the name of it, but it was a, it was society based on based on paranormal studies. Um, they all insisted, no, you've got to face that. You, the guys were like, you got to face the closet. You got to face the closet. The woman was like, I don't have to do anything. If this, if this spirit wants to talk to me, it's got to look at me. But when, when, the, when the woman was looking at the little girl, the voice wouldn't come out. But when the men would go in and face the closet, the little girl would talk, the, the little girl would suddenly find that voice again, and the voice would basically talk and smack about the female investigator. Again, all of this documented on audio. Then on top of all that, it doesn't stop here, everybody. It doesn't stop here. Then there was the guy who was in charge of this, uh, of this case. He had just lost a daughter. He had just lost a daughter. And I can't remember if it was cancer or if it was something equally traumatic. But he got really involved to a point of where he was sending the entire family out. The guy was the guy had done very well for himself. He was sending the family out to, to vacations. They would go away for weekends. And then come back and he'd resume. And whenever the family would leave, no activity. Nothing would happen in the house. And, well, that's the other thing. The other problem was... When you listen to the audio tapes and you see some of the reenactments that these people do, you find out that the that the guys weren't necessarily taking it seriously. They were kidding around with the children. They were playing games. They would what there was one, it was the 70s, there was one where where one of the grown adults got into the same bed as the 16-year-old girl. And yeah, that's the other thing you gotta know. This the other woman was a was a divorcee. So there was no there was no father figure present, <clears throat> which brings us to the third episode in this docu series, and in that docu series, in that docu series, what had happened was they actually found 
the girl. They found the girl, uh, now obviously an, an older woman. And yeah, Bonnie, yeah, Bonnie, it, it's a thing, it's a thing. Um, um, they found the woman and she, she did not, just tuning in, what are we talking about? Uh, Kringle, we are talking about the Enfield Poltergeist and specifically we are talking about the three-part docuseries that is on Apple TV. And in the third part, you come to find out that this woman, the, the young girl, the young the young 12-year-old that grew up to this, this woman, she has been dealing with a lot of mental illness. A lot of mental illness. And that is not a stigma. I want to make sure everybody's clear on that. This is a safe space concerning mental health. And that was the thing that fascinated me so much about the Enfield Poltergeist um, um, docuseries, and, and, and Aurelis can, can attest to this. The first part, you're convinced it's paranormal. The second part, you are convinced, you are absolutely convinced, it's a con. It's an absolute con because this is a, a tw this is a broken family. They want to have they want to enjoy some some nice little you know paid vacations. They want to they want to you know uh, just in, they enjoy having men in the house that kind of thing. And then the last part, you realize that the line between the paranormal and mental health is paper freaking thin. And you begin to wonder if what was being what started as something paranormal because i do believe i really do believe that something at at the at the beginning of this at the very beginning of this investigation it was paranormal but at some point and i really believe that it was when the voice kicked in when the voice kicked in it stopped being paranormal it became an issue about mental health and while the woman is is completely swears up and down I, I, I had no control over that voice. That voice came out of nowhere. I don't know who it was. I don't know what was talking through me. I believe that to a point. I believe it to a point. But I also think this woman was working through some issues. And not only was she working through some issues, so, were the inv so was the principal investigator. This principal investigator looked at, at, at Janet as the daughter that he had lost. And he got too close to an investigation. He got way too close to the investigation. The way it ramped up, it felt like there was a way to keep the attention of the investigator. He became family to them. Exactly. Exactly. So long as something was going on in the house, the, invest the principal investigator would still be invested in them. And, oh my God, that final... Ep there's, a, there's an incredible shot. There's an incredible shot that they did in, um, and for those of you who ha who, are, who are late coming in, what's really cool about the Enfield Poltergeist uh, four, uh, three part, three part series on Apple Plus is they took 700 hours, or they took the 700 hours of, of audio recorded at this event, at this, um, in this investigation, and they hired actors to lip sync to it, and they did reenactments that way. So, so you, you really did become invested in these characters because they were speaking with their actual voices. So if you want to see my take on the Enfield Poltergeist uh, docuseries, that's it. It's called the Enfield Poltergeist One Ghost Hunter's Take. And there's a haunting shot of the, the actor playing the investigator and he's listening to the tapes. And then they did a, a over the shot of the tape, or actually they did a side shot of the tape reel going like this. And then the camera started going around the investigator as well. And they kept cutting back and forth between the tape reel and the investigator and the tape reel and the investigator. And 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 the, the, the accompanying voiceover that went with it was pretty much, he could no longer look at the case impartially. He became just he, he he was and even other people in their in the society. Oh, hang on a minute, the Society for Psychical Research and the people that were involved in the uh, Society for Psychical Research 
really were some very uh, well-off individuals in, uh, in, 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 in British society. Exactly. Five years. They spent, this one guy spent five years on one case. It was, and it, it was aquarium. It was aquarium. It's, 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 first off, one, it is, it is a really well put together documentary. It is three, it is three episodes and it is just gripping from beginning to end. And you do, oh my God, my heart was breaking for Janet because even today she just looks frail. She just looks frail. Oh, first off, I should also say, I'm sorry, Kringle, uh, thank you for the follow and thank you for joining us in this very intense conversation. <laughs> but that was kind of where I was wagging my finger throughout the whole thing with uh, with, with Jack and, and Cindy. I feel like they they really sidestepped. They they really sidestepped um, the, the Enfield Poltergeist documentary. Doc, I really felt like they sidestepped the series because I remember hearing about the infield poltergeist and everyone talking about what an intimate, what, 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 a, what an infamous case it was, but it really, what, what I feel like the infield poltergeist is, is that it starts off as something very paranormal and something you cannot understand. But what it ends up being is that to keep, to keep the investigator and let's just say the entire society engaged and you, each, you even have documents and recordings of some of their meetings where they tell the guy that's doing the Enfield house, they're like, you're too close to this. You're not, you're not showing us evidence. We're just, we just keep getting recordings and we're not seeing evidence. And he's like, the evidence is there. You're just not, you just don't see it. And it was, it was really amazing. It was really amazing. This entire case. And I'm just a little, I'm a little bummed out that uh, that Jack and Cindy didn't do a little more research on it. Um, and I highly recommend, I highly recommend to everybody here, if you have Apple Plus or if you have access to Apple Plus, do yourself a favor and watch the Enfield Poltergeist. It is a unbelievable three part series, and I hope you enjoy it. I hope you enjoy it as much as me and Arellis and, and my wife did. <laughs> Uh, this has been great, but unfortunately I have to go now. Have a good night. Hope to catch you the next stream. Thank you, Aquarius. Thank you so much. Well, and ironically, it's okay. Your, your timing couldn't be better because I am... I, I have reached my conclusion that, um, yeah, I think that uh, that even your heroes are not perfect. And while I love what Jack Osborne does... I unfortunately feel like um, he might have missed a step. He might have missed a step on this one. But um, hopefully, hopefully, uh, he will find he will find some time to watch the Enfield Poltergeist because it's it's a it's a docu series that I think kind of kind of brings to light a few details that that you're not hearing in a lot of the, a lot of the paranormal circles. And on that note. Thank you for watching the Grim Gazette. This has been a lot of fun. This has been a, a really intense deep dive. It's been a while since I've done this intense of a deep dive. And I thank everybody for being here. Remember, if you have a paranormal clip, if you've got something spooky you want to share, if you've got some weird news you want me to cover here, um, you know what to do. You can go on ahead and uh, have a look at our Discord. Go on ahead and swing by Discord. And on our Discord you will find that we have a room dedicated to the Grim Gazette where you can drop in clips, where you can, uh, um, you know, drop in some thoughts. You can also, if you're on YouTube and you're not on our Discord, but if you're on YouTube and you see this and you're like, hey, I've got a clip that I want to submit for T to look at. Hey, I've got a, I've got a weird news story for T. Go on ahead and drop me a comment in this episode of the Grim Gazette. And I'll be more than happy to look over what you're offering and see if I can't put it in there. So thanks, everybody, for being here. Thank you again for giving me your time. Thank you for uh, getting uh, spooky and just talking and all the great questions. That's a beautiful thing about being a paranormal investigator. If you have questions, I'm here for it. I am here for it. So thanks, everybody. Until next week, you know what to do. You know exactly what to do. Stay weird.